Well, recording is in progress, and um, we're making some progress through the book of Colossians slowly. We're in no hurry. God's in no hurry. He wants to show us all kinds of wonderful things, and um, we no need to hurry and miss, miss something. So if you remember last week, we started off by uh, indicating that we're hearing words from another world. We're hearing words from the Creator. I want us to be, again, mindful of what is being discussed, who is being discussed with, who brought this information to us, um, so we can take our minds off of the things of earth and uh, um, look up to the things of heaven, the things that are eternal. The, the earth is temporary. These heavenly words are eternal and help us to uh, better orient ourselves to the things of God and less so the things of man. And so... Uh, we're still in the third chapter, and I want to start, I want to pick up with um, a couple of earlier verses for context here. So let me catch up with you folks. Okay, so um, let's see, referencing uh, verse four, that's when Christ, who is our life, when he shall appear. We know he was going to appear. When he returns, he's going to appear. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And I, I want to set this up. Paul mentioned this before he goes into some of these other things. When Christ, our life, he is our life now. This, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us, quickens our mortal body. Um, he is in us, uh, we are in him, um, he is now our life. Our lives are not our own, they were bought with a, with a precious price, and um, this is the eternal life, this is the abundant life. When Christ, who is our life, when he appears, we're going to appear with him, but we're not going to appear with him on the earth. It, it's very clear that we appear with him in glory. Now, what does that mean in glory? It's a glorious appearing. Glory can refer to up there, in glory as in up. Certainly the glory that emanates from, from God, from the throne of God, the light of God, the power of God is not of this world. It's of the realm where he lives. So we understand that realms are not geographic things. There's no GPS thing that's going to take you from realm to realm. Um, it's like, mm, how do I say it? It's, uh, we know that God is present, but we can't see him. Um, he can see us, we can't see him. He's in another realm. Um, we like to think of terms of heaven being up because the heavens are up in the way we look at it, but the earth is a globe. So up is every single direction, you know, radiating out from the earth. So it's not an up, it's different. It's in another realm. So however it is that Christ appears, um, you know, we hear about when he manifested himself, he was manifested, something became manifest. Manifest means it's evident to the physical senses. It's, it's evident to mankind. It becomes uh, present in this world that it was previously not present in this world. Something that manifests is like, now you see it, now you don't. It manifests, it's not manifest. So when he appears, he, when he manifests, when he determines to be visible to mankind on, on earth, either he came down like he went up or he just appears, but it's in glory. Now, whether in glory is a destination higher than the earth, above the earth, or it's his glorious appearing, we will be with him in glory. It will, we will be transformed gloriously. So at that point, we're aligned with Jesus. We're holy within his holy presence. So bearing in mind that this could, this could happen. Well, it's going to happen. We don't know when. If we're alive at his appearing, we will be like him. Uh, either way, uh, 
we will have resurrected bodies um, transformed to be uh, like his. So then from verse four, let's go up to where Paul says it in verse five, that we are to mortify uh, or put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, not glory, your members, your physical body, put them to death, the, your members which are upon the earth, and then Paul lists out fornication, et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada, yada. Put to death, mortify those things. Um, don't serve them. Don't let them run you. Um, cut that off. You're crucified with Christ to those things. Now, moving up to verse 8, Paul says, but now, after he's uh, li listed all the things that come from uh, uh, the, your members upon the earth, all the unclean things, the inordinate affections, the evil con uh, desires, uh, covetousness, which is idolatry, uh, it's for those things that the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience, uh, in which we also walk. But now, ye also put off all these in addition to mortify the flesh body then put these things off and he lists anger wrath malice blasphemy filthy communication out of your mouth the things that you say so it's not only the practices of the flesh lust of the flesh but the words that are coming out of your mouth put to death those words don't you know you put off those things they're all part of the old man who you were in the flesh in your life on the earth verse 9 Having put off the old man, he tells you, verse eight, but now you also put off these things. Verse nine, having put off the old man with his deeds, mortify those deeds, stop those words and those things. And verse 10, he says, and have put on the new. You have put on the new man. Verse 12, also put on these things. Remember these things like stopping the, the bad conduct, and the bad words. Now he says, put on. See, we have the putting off, putting off, the mortifying, putting off. Now it's putting on the bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind. Um, humbleness of mind, he throws it there in the word in humbleness in, in your minds. Because <laughs> you can act humble. Here, humbleness of mind. Who is it who, um, well, um, humbleness of mind, that would be the opposite of the old man, because the new man is different. It's renewed. It's different from the old man. The old man had all this bad conduct, conduct, but you're putting on the new man, and who is the, the which is the opposite of the old man, the opposite of, of humility, the opposite of humbleness. So humbleness of mind, change your mind to be humble because the old man was inclined to exalt himself, was inclined to pride, was inclined to look at me, aren't I special? Which sounds like uh, the old man your, of your father, the devil, who the devil would say, I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will be like the most high God. So this is humility of mind, humbleness of mind. Now, moving up to verse 14. Now, above all of these, all of these things that, that we put off and we put on, um, he, he says that charity, uh, the, he says, above all these, put on. It's supplied in there, but it's it's it, it's it's implied as the ellipsis of putting on the bowels of mercy and the kindness and uh, humbleness and stuff. Put on charity. Um, and that is the love, which is the bond of perfectness. Um, the verse reads, above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. The whole body is fitly joined together by, by the um, bands and joints uh, that holds all the, 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 uh, the skeletons of the body with the muscles and uh, the, the bands of muscles that wrap the whole thing together. It supports the whole body, uh, supports the head on top. Um, so it's all fitly joined uh, and supported that way. Well, the bond of perfectness, what unites us as believers if it's not love? 
It's the love that Christ extended to us as, as a gift of grace, undeserved, unmerited favor. He, uh, he, we love him because he first loved us. He loved us first. So, wow, you know, um, we didn't have to earn. We didn't have to deserve it. He started out from the get-go loving us, not holding our sins against us. So put on the love, which is the bond of perfectness. We are to be known by our love. Now, that word perfectness, it has to do with the uh, state of completion, something that is complete. It's been, it's been perfected. Uh, it's all finished. There's nothing left to do. It has all been put together. It's all been done. It is finished, like at the cross. It's been done. Um, nothing more to be added. Um, and it's, it's from the word uh, teleos, which is receiving the end of something now. And so this is uh, uh, teleotis, but it refers to the state of completeness, of moral and spiritual perfection. Moral and spiritual perfection is found only in Christ. It's something that he placed in us, and we have been growing in the knowledge of that, in growing in the grace of God, as he's uh, withheld the he's, he took the judgment so that we could have a clean conscience before God as we work out our salvation as we begin to separate and discern the things that are holy from the profane get our mind renewed and uh, walk with Jesus learning more and more of him of a revelation of him growing and growing daily um, and that is because with the, with the love putting on that love the bond of perfectness, the thing that binds us to Christ is the, that state of moral and spiritual perfection that we receive now, even though we're still growing in it. We've received the end of our salvation now, and we're growing towards the fulfillment of it from of the completion that exists within us. Experientially, we're growing in the knowledge of it. I hope that makes that, uh, that clear. Um, and then... In verse 15, where he says, and uh, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That the point that Paul's trying to get across is um, the peace of God has been given to us because the controversy of our sin between him and us has been removed. There's peace. There's reconciliation. It's all copacetic. God loves us. He's not holding our sins against us. He's removed our sins as far as the East is from the West and removed them no more. It's all love. It's a big love fest between us and, and God. So the peace of God is what rules or sits on the throne of your heart. Now, that word to rule um, means like an umpire of a ball game. What does the umpire do? He's the one that calls the strikes and the uh, and the balls. Um, he's got the authority to to decide, uh, you know, uh, whether it's a foul ball or not. He's the umpire. That's his job. He's the one who who can determine those things. He can uh, decide a controversy or a question. He's the umpire. So he's making judgment calls about this or that because he's the authority in there. Well, if peace was the guiding authority, is this peaceful, not peaceful? Is this, is this copacetic with peace or is it militating against peace? Are you with me? If peace is ruling, anything that's contrary to that is unacceptable. Anything that's, that's, contra that's with that is of God. So the peace of God is like your barometer inside of your heart. We're, we're always to be at peace. Um, Jesus was always cool under no matter what was happening. He didn't break a sweat. Well, he sweat in the garden. But it wasn't, it was, it wasn't because he, um, it was because he was submitting to something that was going to cause that pain. He submitted to the pain. He submitted to the humanness uh, and he reacted in, in human ways, but still he said, not my will, but thy will be done. So here we have the peace of God ruling in our hearts, which is our measuring where we're at. It's like to navigate. Uh, you want to follow after peace. Uh, we're also called to do. 
Um, so if you look at um, 15, uh, the second part of that, he says, now we're, we have the peace of God being the umpire calling the strikes uh, and, and foul balls and stuff like that in our hearts. He says, the peace of God to which also ye are called. We are called in peace. He says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which, referring to the peace, to the which we are also called in one body and be thankful. The, all believers in Christ are called to that peace and we're called to that love because we're, we're to um, um, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So you have love binding everything together and we have peace as the, the barometer or the compass that is calling the shots in our heart. We're to follow after peace. We're to be peacemakers. We're to have a peaceful resolution to all things. We're to avoid conflict. It should all, and it's all possible to resolve all things in Christ through peace. Um, and so then the last thing I want to talk, talk about here is verse 16, where Paul says, let the logos of Christ, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly um, or abundantly is a better word. Um, and dwell is to abide. Uh, dwell is where it lives. Um, the word of Christ. Uh, the Greek word there is logos. There's two words uh, in the Greek for word, basically, rhema and logos. And um, this one, logos of Christ. Let's have a little lesson in the difference between rhema and logos. Um, logos, the word of God. There's two primary Greek words that describe scripture, the word of God it's as scripture, which are translated in the New Testament. The first, logos, refers principally to the total inspired word of God and to Jesus. You think about the total inspired word of God. That's how, that's the whole the whole Bible. Well, it's also Jesus because he is the word made flesh. He's the logos made flesh. Logos is where we get uh, the word logic from. Um, so uh, some examples of where logos is used in the scriptures. Um, in the beginning was the word logos and the word logos was with God. Now that's the... Greek translation of the Hebrew. Um, the seed, let's see, John 1, 1, the seed is the word of God. The seed is the logos of God. You know, so or so is the word, the seed is the word. So the, the seed is the logos of God. Um, Luke uh, 8, 11, uh, Am I getting this references following? References follow it. That was Luke 8, 11. Holding forth the word of life. The Logos is Philippians 2, 16. The seed is the word of God. Uh, Logos, holding forth the word, the Logos of life. And Philippians, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Logos of truth, the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, for the word, the logos of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing between the soul and spirit. Um, that's in Hebrews 4.12. And then being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, incorruptible by the word or the logos of God, which lives and abides forever. 1 Peter 1.23. Okay, so it's logos. All the, all the scriptures, uh, the written word and the living word. Okay, rhema is also translated um, word. And that is the spoken word. Um, the second primary Greek word that describes scripture 
is rhema, which refers to a word that is spoken and means an utterance. A rhema is a verse or portion of scripture that the Holy Spirit brings to our attention with application to a current situation or a need for direction. It's a specific word. Every word of God is inspired. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Every word of God, every rhema of God. Um, it is the Holy Spirit who illuminates particular scripture, uh, scriptures for application on our daily walk with the Lord. So that is a way of understanding the difference. Um, Logos is all of scripture. It is Jesus. Um, Rhema would be a, uh, the spoken word, a particular verse or passage uh, in the scriptures. Okay, so that is, let's see where we are. Let the word of Christ, the logos of Christ, dwell in you richly. Live in you richly. He is in you and with you. Our relationship with him is, um, how should I say it? It's enhanced by the renewing of the mind. It's greatly enhanced by the renewing of the mind, by the washing of the water of the word. You can be saved and just read worldly literature and not grow in the knowledge of Christ. Um, they work together. The living word and the written word, they speak, they speak of one another. Um, you want to let the word of Christ dwell in you abundantly in all wisdom. Here's where it gets, this is one of the things that I read a bunch of times and I, I wanted us to consider how we apply the next part of, of verse 16. See, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, but then he goes on to say, teaching and admonishing one another. Oh, but I'm not a teacher. I don't have that gift. Well, maybe some people have a teaching gift, but we're all called to share the gospel. Um, we should all know the gospel. Uh, we should all desire to know more about the word. We should all desire to spend time with the Lord, to get to know him through the scriptures so that we're more adept at being able to share the love of God and through the knowledge of God. Uh, it's one thing to talk about your own experience. That's a wonderful thing, sharing your testimony. But when you begin to become more comfortable with having the scriptures come out of your mouth, you then become a living example of the written word. You, uh, if you can just, if you put things in your own words, which is fine to do, but there's a, there's a difference when you are actually speaking the words from the Bible. The words of the Bible have been tested and tried over, over millennia. Your words, not so much. Uh, not that they cannot be completely in, uh, in tune with each other. You can put, you can paraphrase the Bible and not lose the, uh, the the intention or the meaning of it. But when you are actually speaking the words of God from the Bible, you have the heft of the testing and the trials that the Bible has been through over millennia. It carries some weight to it, uh, different than your own, you know, your own thoughts about it. Um, you see, when I teach, I use examples from my life but I'm using, I'm using the actual scriptures as the basis. And in my experience with those scriptures as amplification of it, or uh, to give it another glance, another angle at it. Now, we are therefore to let the word logos dwell in us, teaching and admonishing one another. Um, to admonish is to correct somebody if they've gone off course. 
if their thinking is wonky or if they uh, need some correction about uh, mistakes or errors. Uh, and you, you do that in love because we've also, um, um, we're called in, in love. Where was that first? Um, putting on, uh, above all things, putting on love, the charity, the bond of perfectness. So we're teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Listen to that again. Let the peace, let the logos of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, groovy, teaching and admonishing, groovy, one another, other believers, other people in the body, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, teaching and admonishing in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Well, we sing at church. We sing at least a couple of songs. Generally, they're hymns. And then we listen to a song, you know, with one of the videos that I'll select, which is fine. Do we understand that when we're singing at church, we are teaching and admonishing one another in those psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? I don't know what else Paul means here. Do you get together with your friends and you sing to them? Well, why not? I think it's actually kind of lovely. Now remember, my experience was different from most of yours because I spent 11 years with a small group of believers who were singers and musicians. And we actually did sing to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to God. And then we would do that at, um, at Thursday evenings. And later on, it was twice on Sundays mornings and then Sunday evenings, as well as other special meetings and things in other churches and convention centers and meeting rooms and stuff like that where guest speakers would, would come into town. And we did a little traveling, but not that much. But I had a wonderful experience singing um, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with a really groovy group of people. What does that look like? Do we see that happening? I'm just talking between us. Is It's right there. And it couldn't be more plain. If you think about the Bible, we certainly know the Psalms are mostly songs, poems and songs, but the majority of the Bible writers, not necessarily the majority of all of the text, but the majority of the contributors to these scriptures were musicians. David was a musician. I'm just saying it didn't seem unusual for Paul to say that we should be teaching one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Is the two or three songs that we sing the beginning bit before, you know, I start the message on Sundays? Is that what he's talking about? Could be. Um, don't know. Um, you know, this was 2,000 years ago. Uh I don't know how frequently they got together. They, they, they didn't have church buildings like we do. Um, they got together in people's homes. Um, but the idea, I, th I just think it's quite lovely, the idea of singing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So let's just think about that. I don't really have anything to say other than I think it's beautiful. Uh, I don't think we're experiencing it. And I think what passes for worship music or Christian music these days um, leaves me cold. Uh, I prefer the old hymns where the language is understandable. It's not hipster jargon. It's good doctrine. It's it's actually lovely, you know, words and the melodies are 
uh, are are beautiful, even sophisticated melodies um, and stuff. I don't find it trance inducing like a lot of the stuff these days is. But it's just maybe I'm just getting old. But either way, um, let's think about what does this mean. Now I want to move on to um, verse seventeen, which is the one I'll close with. Where Paul says he, he's he's cited these things about putting to death the, you know the, the therefore your members, and he's talking about having you know put off the all these things of the old man, and uh, we've have put on the new man that is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, um, put on this love which is the bond of perfectness. Let that peace of God rule. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, sing the songs to each other. Whatever you do, he leaves it wide open. And whatever you do in word or deed, whether it's coming out of your mouth or your service with your hands or something that you're doing, whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, to do something in the name of the Lord Jesus, it implies what I was talking about a couple of weeks ago. It's different or somewhat, maybe it's not that clearly different between doing something in Christ or in him versus doing it in the name of. In the name of implies or that you are doing it under the authority of, and with the cooperation of, with the same intention of the one that you serve. Um, it's like stop in the name of the law, okay? As a police officer could do and should do. He doesn't have any, uh, any power or authority of his own. He's just Barney Fife. But when he says stop in the name of the law, the whole law from the Supreme Court all the way down to all the jails and all of the guns and all of the the tools of law enforcement are standing there right with him, basically. So when it comes to whatever, whatever you do, whether it's in word or deed, uh, all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do it in the name of Jesus. And I don't necessarily think that's something you need to proclaim. I don't think that needs to come out of your mouth. You can do things uh, deeds in the name of the Lord um, because you know who you are. You know who you are in Christ. You know that you're doing it in his name to advance his cause, not in your name to exalt yourself. Maybe that's uh, uh, an easier way to, uh, to, to think of it. As to do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. So now... I think we've gotten our half hour in. I'm sorry, it's a little late because I had the login issues, but thank God it all worked. And um, I'm going to call call it a night for this, um, but I don't want to end without uh, giving anybody a chance. If you have any questions, if you have anything that you'd like to um, add, that's fine with me. You can turn your mics and cameras on if you want to, it's optional. Um, if not, that's fine. I will wish you all sweet dreams and uh, good night. Look forward to seeing those of you who attend on, on Sunday and those of you who watch online. I hope you look forward to seeing me. Um, I will post this message tomorrow morning for those who uh, catch it later. It'll be on our YouTube page. So that being said, you guys are all a blessing to me and uh, uh, I wouldn't be here without you. Appreciate it. So I love you. Sweet dreams. I'll catch you later. Thanks.